My name is Noel Campbell. I'm the Associate Director of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies here at the Australian National University. With my colleague Luis Salvador Carula, the head of the Centre for Mental Health Research at ANU, it's my great pleasure to host this first session in a series of five webinars on the public health and policy impact of COVID-19 in Latin America. In line with the custom here at ANU, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands the university is located and pay respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the collaboration of the universities of Newcastle, Notre Dame, New South Wales, and the Sydney University Research Community for Latin America. As you can see from the slide, Today's seminar will focus on setting the scene and examining the evidence about the public health and policy impact of COVID-19 in Latin America. I will shortly call on Luis to provide an overview of the series and to introduce our three speakers. Please note that all webinars in the series will be recorded and made available publicly. After the three presentations, Luis will moderate a discussion, drawing on questions that we invite you to submit using the chat function at the foot of your screen. We ask that you press the Enable All Participants button so that everyone can see their question. And if you need to contact any of us during this session, please use the chat facility in Zoom to send a private message. You can also follow comments on the presentations via Twitter by going to the handles indicated on the screen. Before passing the floor, or should I say the screen to Luis, let me provide a bit of context as to why we're focusing on Latin America, why Latin America matters. For those of you who've seen my CV, you'll note that I've served twice in Latin America, most recently as Australian ambassador to Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay. In each case, I returned to Australia feeling a bit frustrated because I was convinced that our relations with Latin America were far from realizing their full potential. The fault of course lies on both sides, just as the challenge to strengthen relations also lies with both parties. It's not that there's a bad disposition on either side, on the contrary, in my experience throughout Latin America, there's a very good feeling about Australia, just as there's a good feeling about Latin America amongst the Australian community, but it's very stereotypical. For example, if I mention to Latin colleagues I'm from Australia, the response is immediate. Ah, kangaroos, Sydney Opera House, white sandy beaches, Nicole Kidman. But let's be fair. If I mention to my Latin American colleagues I'm from Australia, to my Australian colleagues I'm interested in Latin America and have served in Latin America, the response is equally instant and equally stereotypical. Fiesta, siesta, football, and maybe Pope Francis. It's all very positive, but very superficial. So this raises the question, why Latin America? Well, let me tell you why. Latin America is a market of 652 million people. It's immensely rich in resources, especially agriculture and mining. It has a middle class that's growing as every day goes by. Almost all have democratic governments committed to free markets. And until COVID, it enjoyed as a region a decade of economic growth. Three countries in the region, like Australia, are members of the G20. And in the next 25 years, two of the seven largest economies on the planet will be in Latin America, Brazil and Mexico. In political and economic terms, it is clear by any measure then that Latin America matters. We hope to demonstrate through this series of webinars that in terms of public health and health policy, Latin America's experience also matters. We're not attempting to cover the entire Latin American experience. Rather, we'll look at the strengths and weaknesses of the region in its handling of COVID-19. We'll look at the evolution of the pandemic since March. And in addition to the health impact, we'll look at its economic and political impact. And ultimately, we'll try to draw lessons learned, both positive and less positive from those experiences. 
Obviously, the region has demonstrated both strengths and weaknesses in dealing with the spread of the virus. As to the strengths, geographical distance and isolation meant the region had the comparative advantage at the onset of the pandemic because it was delayed. This delay provided governments time to observe and learn from the success stories such as China and South Korea and the mistakes such as in Europe and the United States. And this in turn helped the authorities in the region to react early to take drastic measures sooner. As to the weaknesses, the reality is that many if not most Latin American countries lack the means, the resources, the technology and the capability needed to follow the example of the success stories. The key to tackling the pandemic is not so much focusing on its inevitable arrival in any given country, as preparing to restrict its spread. But that sort of preparation requires having sufficient resources and infrastructure available for strengthening surveillance, for training the health service providers, for preventing the propagation of the virus, for maintaining essential services to slow down transmission and providing sufficient beds and emergency services for those who do contract it. In these areas, the health situation between Latin American countries has shown itself to be very uneven, very heterogeneous. Even within countries, the ability or not to reach out to vulnerable groups has been exacerbated by significant social and economic inequalities amongst rich and poor, men and women, rural and urban communities, educated and non-educated people. At the beginning of the pandemic, these factors seem not to be so critical, but let's look at the evolution of the situation since March, which changed very rapidly. During the first three months, most Latin American countries were able to take advantage of the time lapse between the rising caseload in China and Europe on the one hand, and its arrival in the Americas on the other. With very few confirmed cases and fewer deaths than those regions, most Latin American countries, with the possible exception of Brazil, Mexico and Nicaragua, began to adopt prevention measures such as confinement and curfews and quarantines. This period of anticipation served to avoid an immediate crisis and the collapse of regional health services. The trouble is the prevailing feeling that the contagion was under control led most countries at that time to consider easing restrictions and the possibility of de-escalation measures. After the second half of May, however, the region faced two simultaneous crises, one related to health, the other to the economy. For some months, Latin America actually surpassed the US and Europe in the number of new daily COVID-19 infections. But then the figures began to show that the peak of the pandemic was still to be reached. And except for Costa Rica, Cuba, Paraguay and Uruguay, that the projected de-escalation would be precipitous. The region went from believing that it had the pandemic under control to becoming one of the world's epicenters. And the narrative changed from talking about a plateau of contagions and a gradual reopening of productive activities to new confinement measures and mandatory quarantines. Finally, let's consider the broader impact of this change of narrative in the region. The most obvious impact has been to expose the weakness of the health system in the major countries of Latin America. They face the immediate future with high and in some cases overwhelming pressures on national health systems. These pressures are compounded by the adverse economic impact of the spread of COVID. Economies have contracted, unemployment has soared, remittances from abroad have fallen, the price of commodities on which many depend have declined, tourism has dried up, and the international trade and investment has fallen. The Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean estimates that nearly 12 million people will join unemployment in 2020, and the number of poor will increase from 118 million to 126 million. The social deterioration that followed them to the pandemic in Uruguay, for instance, President Luis Alberto Lacalle, after having made his country a positive example in the fight against COVID-19, has seen his national party or its coalition allies 
convincingly win local elections in September. In contrast, the president, presidential election in Bolivia resulted in the party and allies of the interim president losing power to the former ruling party, at least in part as punishment for her handling of the COVID-19. Looking ahead to 2021, there will be presidential elections in Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Nicaragua and Honduras, and there'll be midterm elections in Mexico and Argentina. It'll be fascinating indeed to see how the handling of COVID by incumbent leaders and parties in whose countries impacts, how they impact on the electoral outcome. So in sum, even though the focus of this series of webinars is the health and health policy impacts of COVID-19 in Latin America, the other important takeaway is the interconnectedness of COVID-19's health impact with the economic and political outcomes. That concludes my remarks. So let me now pass the screen to my colleague, Luis Salvador Carula. Luis, over to you. Luis, we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Noel, for your introduction and um, uh, welcome everyone um, uh, to this uh, webinar series. I, I will provide you an introduction on, on why we are preparing this webinar series and, um, and then we will move to the presentations today. Um, we started to um, uh, be uh, concerned and, um, and interested in, in the evolution of COVID uh, around the world in last March. And we ran then in March and early April, a first series of uh, webinars on the situation in different countries. And uh, we were analyzing the situation in, in Europe, in, um, in Taiwan and um, in United States and, and Australia. By that time, as um, Noel said, the situation was starting uh, to appear in, um, in, in Latin America, but it was uh, by far not so serious of what was happening then in the US and in Europe. And as part of that, um, we had this uh, COVID-19 first webinar series focus on, on mental health, but also revising the general situation in these countries. And uh, we were able to put forward a, a very interesting uh, network. We call it the Mental Health International Network or Pam Mehin to analyze the situation and the, and the consequences for mental health in, in eight uh, countries around the world. Uh, we published what uh, were the lessons learned on how to try to develop a rapid response to crisis uh, where we can use expert knowledge uh, drawn from uh, digital conferencing as a critical tool to understand uh, in um, quick appraisal what was happening. And then we applied that to uh, the area of mental health. And this um, has been published in an excellent um, special issue of health policy and technology uh, that has been coordinated, coordinated by our colleague uh, Francesco Paoluzzi. Um, I will introduce him later on. So uh, after this um, uh, webinar series, um, 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 I was contacted by Noel uh, Campbell on the possibility of organizing one on the public health impact of COVID-19 in Latin America. And, uh, we've been working on, on that project for the last uh, uh, two months. Uh, the whole idea, as he said, is to really understand what's happening in a critical uh, region in the world. And uh, we will start this first webinar by revising the evidence in um, relation of what is happening in the collaboration between a series of Australian universities uh, with other Latin America research centers and, and public health agencies 
on um, in relation to COVID-19. Uh, then uh, have a second webinar next week uh, on um, uh, Thursday 12th in, in Latin America, Friday 13th here in Australia on the situation in South America. We will focus on Brazil, Chile and Uruguay, but the whole idea is to understand what is happening in, um, in uh, South America in relation to um, the pandemic. Then we will have a third uh, webinar uh, focusing on Central America and the Caribbean um, uh, that will take place on Thursday 19 or Wednesday 18 of November. A uh, fourth seminar uh, focusing on mental health uh, that will take place on the 26th of November or 25th of November in Latin America. And finally, a, a fifth uh, webinar on um, Thursday 3rd in, in, uh, of December in, in Australia, Wednesday 2 in Latin America, that will be run in Spanish to provide a summary and a review of the lessons learned in this webinar series. Um, I, I would like to start by mentioning our logo. Um, maybe um, many of you are familiar with uh, this image. It's the image of the Chimborazo volcano um, in, in Ecuador. And, um, um, and this was um, one of the images uh, that was designed by Humboldt in his expedition in the early 1800s um, uh, to Latin America. This is considered the, the real um, starting point of modern science. So we cannot understand modern science uh, without thinking in Latin America. All the uh, major efforts related to the origin of research, of uh, systematic appraisal, uh, of um, not only, as uh, everyone knows, the theory of evolution, but also with the starting point uh, made by Humboldt in his expedition to Latin America. So we cannot understand our current scientific knowledge without thinking in Latin America. And uh, this is also critical for public health, the first uh, global uh, public health uh, um, uh, strategy uh, was um, uh, the one of the vaccination of uh, small po smallpox in, in, in Latin America by the Balmis expedition. And uh, uh, we have to think also that the Pan American Association uh, Organization of Health, the PAHO, uh, it's um, uh, 40 years older than the World Health Organization. It's the first uh, international organization on health is the Pan American one. And also uh, that the first experiences on public health were um, um, uh, carried out in Latin America in the uh, 1950s. So really uh, the importance of Latin America as a center of research and uh, a center of public health is absolutely pivotal in the world. So that's why we choose the Chimborazo um, 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 engraving by Humboldt uh, just to uh, explain the importance of Latin America and how this curve of the volcano can also tell us something about uh, uh, the evolution of the pandemics. And uh, as I was saying before, uh, our first webinar is focusing on the evidence of what's happening in, um, in Latin America. And we wanted uh, to provide um, some hints on how a series of uh, Australian researchers um, are highly involved with uh, Latin American colleagues in understanding the situation there. And uh, uh, fortunately, we have uh, a major leaders in, in this area today to uh, tell us about the situation there. I will introduce every one of them uh, when they speak. So we will start by uh, Francesco Paolucci, who will talk about the importance of, uh, from the regional perspective 
on the broad general situation in Latin America. Francisco is professor of health economics and policy at the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Newcastle, Australia. And also uh, he's professor of the School of Economics Management uh, at the University of Bologna, Italy. Uh, he has a very large experience on engaging health economics policy around the world. And he has worked closely with the Chilean uh, government in the uh, design of um, uh, the health policy uh, there. So I give the digital floor uh, to Francesco um, that um, he, he can stand, start his presentation now. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for your uh, kind introduction. Um, going to upload my slides. I hope uh, everybody can see them. Uh, so, um, as Luis, uh, Luis, uh, I also want to thank Noel and Luis for organizing this uh, incredibly important um, series of webinars with the Latin American Focus. Uh, indeed, I would say that there are a number of uh, researchers and uh, analysts in Australia and also globally that are looking at Latin America. Um, as uh, Noel clearly pointed out, it's, it's an extremely uh, important region, uh, you know, both in terms of, of uh, trade partnerships, but also from a cultural perspective with uh, its contribution uh, broadly uh, to, to the world. So. Uh, for, for me, it's been always an area of great interest and uh, today I will uh, present the work that we develop also with the great contributions of Lewis team and, uh, and other, I would say, um, 80 researchers uh, in the world uh, based in Europe, in Latin America, US, Canada, Australia, uh, Southeast Asia, that join um, the uh, value in health economics and policy network. Uh, to prepare the special issue that has just been uh, recently uh, published and made available online. I'll have some um, slides with the links uh, later on. And one of the papers that uh, uh, we uh, focused on, in fact, it's on Latin, um, um, it's not in Latin American countries, in particular five Latin American countries. Um, so this is some information, as I said, about the special issue uh, for those interested. So this paper, as, as Luis indicated, um, it's an effort uh, that uh, um, jointly um, was made jointly by Australian-based uh, uh, and uh, um, Latin American-based uh, researchers, main, mainly from uh, Chile and, and Brazil. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, really focus on the policy responses to uh, COVID-19 in uh, fundamentally uh, the, these five countries, Brazil, uh, per, uh, Peru, um, uh, Colombia, uh, Chile, and Ecuador. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, interesting approach I think that we took was uh, rather than going into the prediction mode, uh, we really tried to look at uh, the context at the outset, so the pre-pandemic context and really focus on the mitigation strategies. Obviously, uh, the reaction globally, as we've seen or started seeing in February and March, the first images from uh, Italy was very defensive and uh, um, probably also not necessarily well uh, uh, adapted to the conditions on the ground. Uh, obviously, that, that has been, uh, uh, I would say, a, a pretty standard approach uh, in, 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 a, in a global uh, sense. So we observed uh, responses uh, from a policy and technology perspective uh, that were very similar, very, uh, uh, in some cases, very um, uh, much focusing uh, on the same issues and, and probably uh, now that we've been in this for, for a while, we understand that uh, the context is, is fundamental, the context on, on the ground. Uh, in particular, Latin American countries, as Noel pointed out in its uh, introduction, uh, have some clear uh, peculiarities clearly uh, related to um, 
uh, inequalities uh, in, in socioeconomic characteristics of the population and their access to health services. So a supply side, uh, uh, let's say heterogeneity that it's uh, a characteristic not only of, of Latin American countries, but it's quite um, pronounced um, uh, as well as the distribution of the population between uh, major cities and, and remote uh, communities. Obviously, our uh, analysis tried to document uh, also the different level uh, of interventions uh, uh, from a, a governance perspective. So trying to understand uh, whether uh, uh, th th there has been or, or there has been even uh, an improvement in the way the coordination, the response uh, within countries uh, between different uh, jurisdictions has uh, occurred and whether it has uh, uh, improved over time. And this has been a characteristic or, or let's say a challenge uh, in, in most countries, also in Europe. And, and uh, what we are observing now in Europe is, 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 between, let's say, in, in terms of the coordination between regional and, and national governments is clearly uh, still after so many months, uh, um, very complicated. Um, uh, Italy, I think, and Spain uh, uh, can be uh, two, two examples uh, of how complex these um, um, uh, responses uh, are uh, in terms of implementation, also Australia uh, for that matter. And, and there are good and bad examples in every country, I should say. So the, uh, the, the characteristics that, that, that are important to um, point out when we think about Latin America and in, the, in particular in these uh, five countries that we focused on um, are clearly related to the uh, development profiles of, of these countries. And clearly, uh, when we uh, started observing this, uh, both in terms of population uh, density, um, formal and uninformal uh, or informal um, employment, and also um, uh, HDIs and, and poverty rates, we, we really start uh, seeing that uh, you know, th these are important characteristics that cannot be um, um, like, you know, left aside when thinking about uh, the, the potential impact of a, a given policy or an introduction of a certain technology uh, that is similar to uh, policies uh, or technologies that are introduced in uh, countries where uh, these figures uh, fundamentally uh, are uh, different. In fact, the high uh, level of informality and, and the poverty rates, including uh, the access to uh, proper sanitation, uh, it's, it's a challenge uh, in these countries and it varies greatly um, uh, between um, uh, urban uh, and rural uh, parts of, the, of these countries. But even in urban uh, parts, the differentials are, are quite great, as you can see from this summary table. <laughs> Clearly, when we think about health, we, we can't um, um, skip the healthcare system uh, characteristics of these countries. And, uh, once again, there is quite an important uh, heterogeneity when it comes to the organization of healthcare systems in these countries with a great uh, variety between public and private mixes. But what it's constant is that uh, there is quite a, a lot of reliance on uh, user payments or out-of-pocket payments, which clearly create uh, almost an intrinsic uh, issue in the access to uh, healthcare, uh, and uh, that is uh, being traditionally a problem uh, of uh, emerging economies um, uh, to try and formalize and extend the coverage uh, of uh, uh, the financial expo exposure to health uh, risks. And uh, in, in Latin America, th this applies also to um, what here in Australia or in Europe are used to uh, have uh, almost as for granted as the, the access, for example, to emergency or hospital. Uh, care. Um, not only that, but also access to uh, doctors, nurses, and other, uh, you know, primary point uh, of care. This, this is not for all Latin America or Central American countries, of course. There is a lot of variation, um, uh, but what we can see in, in general terms is that, uh, yeah, there is a supply side uh, problems, and in particular for COVID, uh, uh, the presence of ICU beds with um, uh, ventilators um, uh, has been uh, a challenge. Uh, finally, to set the scene, um, we uh, uh, also have to, to recognize that Latin America has done uh, very well in terms of health risks 
uh, over the past decades and economic growth has clearly contributed greatly um, uh, to it in, uh, around the, um, the region. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the, there is a lot still uh, uh, to be done in particular uh, because of uh, the, um, uh, I would say, parallel uh, good um, outcomes of, of economic growth in terms of life expectancy and uh, compression of both morbidity and mortality. Um, but also we have to uh, keep in mind that uh, economic growth comes uh, with uh, um, uh, other, uh, let's say, uh, rich nations' uh, uh, problems. Uh, clearly, these are problematic when COVID uh, hits, as we've seen comorbidities do matter in terms of uh, mortality and obesity, certainly it's uh, uh, a concern um, in, in this region, as in many other uh, in, in the world. So in terms of the response, um, three main points uh, of interest to explain the, the pandemic response in these uh, countries. Certainly the timing and the stringency of the measures that have been adopted. Uh, what we have observed is that um, the lead time provided by uh, the famous um, second um, eat country, uh, Italy, that it's uh, um, now remembered and very vivid in uh, everyone's memory, um, as, as allowed some uh, countries, most countries actually in, in Latin America to uh, uh, think about uh, uh, this and react quite uh, quickly, I should say, and pretty strongly, uh, both in terms of mitigation uh, and containment of the spread of the disease or, or the virus, um, and also in terms of economic uh, responses. The second point of interest in terms of the uh, pandemic response is in terms of compliance um, with the, the, these measures, which were uh, in most countries very prolonged. And to understand this better, we looked at the mobility of individuals, whether it has changed and decreased really, uh, and uh, also in terms of uh, uh, the uh, communication and pandemic management strategy and the socioeconomic context. Finally, we also look at the health and, uh, healthcare system uh, response to the policies introduced, what, what has been done and in what areas. So in terms uh, of capacity uh, investments uh, and uh, increases and, and, and also in terms of testing and tracing capacity. So we can say that the response, as I pointed out, um, you know, it was quite um, rapid. It was a, a good result of, of observing what was happening elsewhere. Uh, and it has been also by and large quite strong. Uh, so by means of uh, various indexes that uh, have been developed uh, around the world, uh, the measures have been largely quite uh, stringent and very close to the first cases, the first deaths and so on. The reality of this, um, though, hasn't really reflected well on uh, the uh, evolution of, of the disease or uh, the expansion uh, and contagiousness of the uh, pandemic. So the stringency that has worked very well uh, in, in Europe um, and for a shorter period of time uh, didn't necessarily work uh, in all areas in, in the countries that we observed. And in fact, cases kept going up and um, uh, related to that also in, in rates term, uh, mortality and saturation uh, indexes uh, also um, uh, showed sign of, of deterioration. Uh, clearly the big exception in there was Chile and one um, uh, of, of the reasons uh, related to that is, is probably the the, 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 the answer will come uh, uh, later on, but it's clearly re related to the, the uh, public sector uh, uh, presence, uh, both uh, territorially and, and institutionally, but also uh, I would say that the importance of, of, uh, um, uh, of the socioeconomic uh, factors uh, in that. Uh, obviously, in terms of uh, uh, the overall uh, uh, context, um, uh, the, the, the conclusion that we took from this is that the timing of the measures were not appropriate. Um, uh, and uh, clearly, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, these measures or measures of, of such stringency cannot be kept for so long, uh, in particular in countries where uh, the uh, mobility is a factor for the livelihood of a large part of the population.
Now, in terms uh, of, uh, of compliance, as I just mentioned, uh, some of the evidence that we surveyed uh, really showed that, in fact, mobility didn't uh, hold up uh, as well as in other parts uh, of the world, and it has a socioeconomic uh, uh, dimension. So uh, when we look at Chile, uh, i.e. income municipalities really um, uh, complied more uh, than uh, lower or more vulnerable uh, uh, groups, and, and this clearly um, as an impact also because of the quality of, of the mobility in lower socioeconomic uh, groups. It, it comes with uh, um, uh, proximity to, to other people, so uh, public transportation and so on. Finally, uh, there is to, uh, uh, some things need to be said about the public management and the communication strategy in particular in the first phases, but it's not necessarily being resolved and also the signal that are sent uh, just by simple uh, government actions like uh, the, the, the organization of, of government and, and the uh, maintenance of ministry in Chile. And there, there has been, in fact, a change in the Ministry of Health uh, in Brazil, uh, twice, in fact. And uh, uh, the uh, communication uh, has been um, quite uh, complex. In, in, in a nutshell, uh, messages were not necessarily aligned between different levels of government uh, and uh, so local or national but also within uh, uh, the government there were uh, different views and quite uh, quite often made made public that confused uh, certainly uh, the population which is key in a containment of of a, uh, of a contagion or, or the spread of the disease and uh, um, uh, clearly uh, that affects also trust as, as uh, the paper from Fatser uh, shows, uh, which I think is, is a very uh, important one. And also David Savage and others have, have looked at trust in healthcare system. And really there is increasing evidence of the importance of this element. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the, the, the interesting um, um, outcome of this pandemic it's uh, uh, been the rapid response this with the rapid response and we've seen it not only in health policy but also in technology and uh, louis uh, uh, has written incredibly interesting work uh, focusing on, on mental health in particular but clearly uh, health system ca capacity and public health system capacity has uh, increased greatly uh, across the region um, and uh, um, some have even uh, asked uh, you know, almost uh, uh, provocatively, what, why did we have to wait for, for this pandemic to have such um, uh, a ramp up in terms of, of capacity to, to provide a service publicly? Um, it, it's very significant, uh, the response of the healthcare system, uh, particularly uh, for uh, Chile and Peru. Now, uh, obviously, that doesn't come uh, um, let's say uh, mm, as uh, simple for other areas that are important. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sorry to say that this is not something that everybody has been doing incredibly well. Also Europe has struggled a lot in particular with, with tracing um, and uh, uh, that is critical. And Australia and New South Wales in particular have shown uh, the importance uh, of this, clearly the context on the ground of, of tracing uh, is is uh, very complex in in, in the region and and uh, um, inc incredibly important uh, to recognize that that also many European countries um, have have uh, uh, failed uh, to um, uh, to be effective in this uh, respect. So to conclude, um, I would say that um, the uh, response in Latin America uh, has uh, uh, been uh, over overall quite early uh, with uh, quite strict measures, including lockdowns and curfews that are actually being important in some European countries. Italy starts uh, today with the, the, cur the first curfew uh, since uh, the uh, 20s, 1920s in, in Italy. That, that is a measure that we haven't seen for almost 100 years. Um, and uh, uh, the effectiveness of, of these uh, measures overall um, have uh, uh, been undermined by the overall fragility of, of the healthcare system, but also the um, uh, overall disparities in the country. We can't uh, really um, adopt one size fits all measures uh, going forward to deal uh, with the containment uh, of COVID. 
clearly we have to recognize the importance of the informal uh, sector for survival of large parts, if not the, ma the, the majority of people in, in Latin America. Hence, uh, classic income support policy won't work uh, and, won't, and won't work in favor of, of, of compliance. And if anything, they might even be uh, working against it. Um, uh, obviously, uh, what needs to be kept in, in mind going forward is uh, uh, that investment needs to be made quite soon to early detect, isolate, and, and surveil. Uh, the, the spread um, uh, in presence of future uh, uh, waves uh, as well. Um, and I think this is critical and Australia is a great example uh, for this. Uh, so uh, I wanna thank the uh, whole network. Here are the links. Uh, this network has been incredibly active and uh, um, uh, Luis, uh, Anna, who's here uh, and others that might be connected um, have done a great job in putting this issue together. You can download it both from the Value Health Economics and Policy web, web, uh, web page. You can write us, there is the email there. And all the people have contributed also to uh, do something that it's try to, to create really the people's ac expertise going forward um, uh, to be able to create a, 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 you know, experts and, and people that can work in administrations also in Latin America. And we've started connections with some of these countries so that uh, we can better prepare uh, and help uh, the, the, the local administration to respond. And there are various programs that we've created in this context and you can contact me and us on, on this page. So I thank you very much, um, in particular, uh, Luis, Noel and Marita uh, for having organized this and I'm available for any question. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for this um, interesting presentation. There are many things that I hope we can um, address in the Q&A uh, session. And um, um, I will also uh, um, want to thank you for your uh, collaboration in, in coordinating uh, this uh, webinar series from University of Newcastle and uh, for being one of the conveners of uh, our series. Um, so we will move to uh, the next presentation um, uh, um, by Ana Rita Sequeira. Uh, she's the academic chair of the Health Administration Policy and Leadership Program and lecturer in health policy at the Murdoch University in Western Australia. Ana Rita, um, interest in research includes uh, global health, health policy and economics and how to translate research into practice. Uh, she has been one of the key authors of, uh, of this um, uh, very interesting paper on COVID-19 in uh, five Latin American countries. And uh, this will be uh, the main uh, aspect of her presentation. So, Ana Rita, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Louis, and thank you, Noel, for uh, organizing this very interesting series of uh, webinars um, and also to invite me to be part of it. I also uh, I greet all the uh, uh, participants, greetings uh, from Perth and from Murdoch University. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, um, do an acknowledgement of, of country. Um, I acknowledge that Murdoch University, where I am at the moment, is situated on the land on the water of younger people. I pay my respects to the enduring and dynamic culture and the leadership of the Nyonga elders, both past and present. The Buja, the country on which Murdoch University is located, has for thousands of years been a place of learning, and we at Murdoch University are proud to continue this long tradition. As was said before, uh, I was one of the co-authors uh, in the paper uh, um, that was just uh, um, summarized by Francesco. Um, and I would like to add uh, um, uh, um, to that presentation that he just made and explore some of the other uh, uh, sections that we have also examined under the, that same uh, paper. So what I will be uh, uh, presenting today was some of the COVID-19 uh, epidemiological data analysis that we conducted, looking not just to the direct effects of COVID, and that would be you know, the number of cases and the number of deaths 
uh, um, that occur in those five countries, but also looking to some of the indirect effects. And we were able to find some information that was in the public domain on the spillover effects and also the excess mortality. I will be also be discussing uh, briefly about uh, innovation and technology, uh, because some of these countries were somehow uh, forced to, to innovate and to find uh, local strategies to meet their um, uh, medical supplies and medical technology needs. And also um, a last slide with some reflections moving forward. As was said before, this paper was focusing in five countries. And I might say that there is extreme uh, 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 diversity among them. And if you look to the uh, Latin America region in terms of the COVID response, you will also see that that diversity and heterogeneity is, is very significant. Um, this analysis that we'll be presenting today um, takes us to mid-August. So, and we know how important it is to uh, timely see the way that uh, 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 our, uh, our analysis, because what we have seen more recently is that you know, if, even if during the first wave, the first semester of the year, you know, Brazil, Peru, and Chile were somehow uh, um, at the very uh, um, top uh, uh, countries in, in Latin America, what we are seeing now is that there is a, a slightly shift with, with Argentina and some other countries. So for the sake of this presentation, uh, the majority of the data that I will be presenting will be up to, up to, up to August. And, and as is also mentioned, you know, we did extensive um, uh, qualitative document analysis focusing on, on information that is uh, publicly available uh, by federal and state governments. But we also uh, contacted, uh, be, you know, beyond the, the co-authors that are part of this, of this um, uh, paper. We also contact some some uh, colleagues on the ground, and I would like to uh, public also uh, uh, acknowledge their contributions. We're talking about Eli Matos in Brazil, Carla Neto as well in Brazil, uh, Bernadita uh, Silva and Juan Leo in Chile, Gregorio Velasco also in Chile, um, Pamela Gorgona in Colombia, Francisco Bion in Ecuador, and Tusa Lima in, in Peru. So their contribution was also very important for us um, just to, to get a really good sense of what is happening. So um, looking to, to uh, the epidemiological data, we were able to plot some of the uh, um, confirmed cases um, um, per thousand um, habitants. And as you can see, in, you know, uh, um, Brazil was, uh, um, was quite a, uh, an important uh, uh, country, um, followed by also uh, Chile and, and Peru. And when we look to the number of deaths, it's undeniable that Peru was one of the leading countries, uh, then Chile, Brazil, and Ecuador. It's really important when we look to some of these data that we also be critical that this is the information um, that is uh, you know, publicly available. So um, there were a lot of um, challenges that we faced in terms of data transparency and how the statistics were being published on, on, a, on a daily basis. There were cases in, in Chile, for instance, that the whole website were kind of revamped and the numbers were changed and that I think led to one of the uh, other resignations of one of the ministers of health. So uh, there is a lot of sensitivity around, uh, you know, the data that is uh, reported and, and how it is done. And this just reflects the data that at the time was publicly available. What I did was I just went back uh, um, and using the uh, John Hopkins uh, uh, COVID-19 map, I, I've just got a sense of the, the most late up-to-date uh, statistics for the very same countries. And if uh, some months ago, when we uh, finished our analysis in mid-August, we were seeing, you know, some, some countries uh, are curbing. Now we have a bit of a better sense of how they have progressed since then. And just looking to 
uh, um, those graphs in terms of the number of daily cases, we can see that you know Brazil um, had this first wave and is now curving down. Um, uh, Peru, um, we can say that has is second wave and 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 is now just trying to flattening. And Chile has a, a first wave but has been able to plateau its number of cases uh, since since July. So very different experience in terms of of, of uh, you know, um, COVID direct effects. When we look to the, the daily COVID-19 deaths, you know, uh, uh, certainly that uh, Brazil, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, an outstander. Um, uh, Peru uh, um, has also been having quite, you know, uh, a steady increase in the beginning, but then just uh, plateauing a little bit and, and same, same with, with Chile. Now looking to the indirect uh, effects, we, we were able to access some information in terms of um, uh, COVID-19, uh, sorry, in terms of um, the number of um, the health response and eventually whether some services were diverted or were just put it on hold. And in this slide, you can see uh, respiratory and uh, comparison uh, of the number of emergency admissions for respiratory and cardiovascular diseases um, over uh, uh, you know epidemiological week, weeks and you can see that uh, the blue line reflects you know 2020 there was a significant drop in the doses of admissions and um, panel A and panel B are a bit inconclusive in understanding why there was this reduction but certainly we can hypothesize that there might be a combination of people avoiding to seeking medical care due to COVID, uh, the lockdown measures that also uh, um, prevented people eventually to, 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 to do, uh, you know, to access to health services uh, as, as uh, frequently as they would, but also, and most importantly, the diversion of services because as we will see in the next slide, there were significant services that was simply um, put on hold. In this other slide, we have the spillover effects on the immunizations. Um, and, and this study is uh, from Peru, we just managed to get data up to uh, uh, April, that was the data that was available. And, uh, you know, as we can see, there was a significant drop in the immunization coverage since the start of the pandemic. Um, and we know in this particular case that all the immunization services were, were suspended. Uh, um, and um, we have here uh, um, BCG uh, uh, vaccine um, that was the drop was not as significant as with others, but that is because usually this one is the one that is administered once the child is, the child is born. So there is a lot of, uh, I think, invisible impact about you know what will happen and what does this really meant uh, on the ground. Uh, what we know now, you know, from following some of the initiatives from the Ministry of Health in Peru is that they have uh, uh, resumed. Uh, all the immunization activities they have also at the same time uh, uh, created mobile outreach services uh, to avoid people to concentrate in health services but it's also very interesting to note that for the first time in 20 years uh, Peru is reporting the first case of diphtheria and then again that is one of really the uh, um, the concerns uh, about this sort of spillover effects um, um, and we really, uh, at this stage, it's quite early to know exactly what will be the impact of all the other services that were, were suspended. So um, I think this is something that is it's really interesting uh, uh, to keep monitoring. Looking to um, the excess of deaths uh, um, and the official reported uh, deaths, um, in some countries, we were able to access this data that was publicly available via the death registers. Uh, we calculated the difference between 
the observed deaths in the period between March and July 2020, and the expected death number of deaths occurring uh, to the average row of deaths in previous years. Uh, and we have different years for the row, different time period, given what was available. Um, it is really uh, clear to see that, you know, um, the excess of mortality and also the, the health spillover effect shows that the human cost of the pandemic is far higher than it is currently accounted for in the official uh, data. And this is not only, you know, because there are uh, unreported cases or there is uh, uh, ineffective information systems, which, you know, might be also the case, but this is also because it's really difficult to understand at this stage what is the hidden impact of the diversion of resources to COVID-19. So the excess of mortality that are highlighted here, um, and they are really expressive in, in Peru and Ecuador, doesn't mean that all of those cases are COVID cases. Uh, uh, it might mean that might be other cases that uh, are non-COVID-19 related, but it were impacted with the whole COVID situation. Um, moving forward to briefly uh, uh, discuss uh, innovation and technology. As, as Noel uh, was presenting uh, uh, before, we have uh, um, uh, some of the Latin American countries really have experience in all um, under an investment in, in, in health, uh, uh, um, significant issues with uh, resources. Um, and we also see that uh, this disease was really a uh, fast uh, moving spread. And although the fact that some of these countries were starting to be impacted early in the year with the first cases uh, being reported around uh, early March, um, if it gave them some uh, um, time to learn from other countries' experience, what also happened is that it reduced the access to the global market. Because by this time, the majority of the countries were uh, imposing export bans and restriction measures uh, um, to medical uh, uh, supply uh, products and sanitizers and so on. So what in fact this meant is that some Latin American countries couldn't really go to the global market and purchase those uh, um, those supplies, which you know were incredibly uh, uh, important, and in some cases a lot of the manufacturers were not even uh, in their country. I know there is a particular case of 3M in in Mexico, where you know they were producing all these uh, 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 masks for. Uh, for for the United States and in in, in Mexico they could, they couldn't really access them, so I think that is a really important sort of reflections to keep in mind moving forward and also in terms of the global health discussions. What that means, in fact, is that this um, meant that there was a lack or slow moving in terms of the surge capacity. Not as much for you know bad numbers. Not as much uh, uh, for you know setting up uh, 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 COVID uh, clinics or, or COVID hospitals, but more uh, around you know testing, having IC units with ventilators, having uh, uh, protective equipment uh, for all the medical professionals, and, and that had had a, a huge impact. Uh, uh, on um, healthcare workers, uh, death toll, uh, uh, and also the simply inevitability of those, of those ventilators, of those oxygen uh, bottles. What this all meant was that there were a need for local initiatives to produce uh, uh, supplies. Uh, there were partnerships between the government, the private sector, and the universities. And that has proven to be you know, a quite of a, a, a entrepreneurial and uh, um, innovative way to try to respond to this to this uh, pandemic and to try to supply those life-saving uh, um, um, 
um, products. So to give an example, in Peru, there were local procurement strategies, uh, uh, strategies to manufacture and supply masks and PPEs. And some of the, the, the local universities were also producing uh, mechanical ventilators uh, to provide um, to, to the ICU units across the country. In Chile, the same happened. They were manufacturing their own ventilators. And interesting, they also developed a low cost test for COVID, which had really uh, uh, um, impressive results in terms of the efficacy. And also, you know, that was a paper published on the nature. Um, in Colombia, um, they've used uh, an app that really collect a lot of information about the users in terms of, you know, comorbidities, location, and uh, family context. And this app was integrated with many other platforms and including the, the police system. Uh, it has recorded around you know, 2 million users and the city of Melia was one of the best in Colombia with you know, contact tracing and testing. There were also a lot of you know, criticisms around privacy and how this uh, um, uh, um, information was being used. But nevertheless, this was something that uh, I was highlighted during these first uh, months. In Brazil, we have seen as well uh, our research institutes partnering with government and assisting not only with you know, research and development and various clinical trials and the vaccine, but also with testing and testing capabilities. And across all the countries, we have seen a boost in telehealth services and online training courses for health practitioners. So we have seen, you know, some, some positives and, and really uh, um, uh, you know, health technology being used in various ways and, 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 and local governments trying, trying to, to address some of the, the COVID challenges with these new technologies. And I think moving forward, this will be a very positive legacy um, to, 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 to these countries, as it is also in Australia with, with, uh, uh, with telehealth and other innovations that were implemented. So my last slide is really about reflecting on, you know, the way moving forward and, and what would be uh, some of the uh, key points of a potential roadmap for some of these countries. Of course, as I said before, there's a lot of diversity, uh, but I think uh, what we've seen in terms of the pre-pandemic context is something that it really needs to be addressed. So there is a need for a greater investment in the healthcare infrastructure, health workforce. Uh, I recall uh, that there were particular districts that were heavily impacted by uh, um, COVID-19. And if before the pandemic, we didn't have, we were, the health systems in some of these countries were understaffed. Now with COVID, we've seen that the death toll also amplified that need. So uh, um, there will be a lot of, you know, investment that will also have to, to be done in terms of, you know, uh, strengthening the health workforce. And as also Francesco mentioned, you know, the reduction uh, in health disparities across regions and across populations, it's, it's, it's imperative. And we have seen, uh, you know, rallies and demonstrations on the street and people really uh, are feeling that those inequalities need to be addressed. And health is, it's, it was with COVID, um, a, a way to vocalize those disparities. The COVID situation also uh, uh, highlighted uh, the need for greater integration between the social and the healthcare sectors. As it was seen before, we have uh, a significant percentage of the population that is vulnerable, that depends on the informal sectors. And it's really important that those sectors work uh, closely. Um, and uh, one of the last um, points of that sort of roadmap will be the inclusion of One Health principles underpinning, underpinning the public health before moving forward. What are the risks? Um, the risk is that the economic recovery uh, um, surpasses 
uh, um, the priorities on universal access to basic social services. And here I'm really including all other services in terms of welfare, education, sanitation, water, and so on. As we have seen, uh, the numbers uh, were not um, particularly positive. Um, we keep the risk also that some of these countries continue their politics as usually, as, as uh, Noel very well highlighted, there'll be presidential, federal elections, state elections coming next year. Um, and there might be uh, uh, some ways to just try to disguise the, the impact of, of COVID-19. And as also mentioned bef before in uh, Francesco's presentation, there is significant problem with lack of trust in the government institutions and political parties. Uh, and and um, that might undermine uh, some uh, recovery moving forward. So I thank you very much for, for your uh, attention and for your time. I'm more than happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Anna Rita, for uh, your presentation. I think it's very important to highlight uh, how international comparisons are, are very illustrative of how the situation is evolving. And uh, hopefully we will have time at the Q&A to discuss some of these questions. So I um, would like to introduce uh, Blanca Gallego-Lujan. Uh, she leads the Clinical Machine Learning Research Unit Center for Big Data Research in Health at the University of New South Wales. And uh, she's trained uh, as a physicist, uh, and uh, he uh, obtained her PhD in climate modeling on environmental sciences at the University of California. And since 2006, Blanca works on the analysis of medical data and the development and application of artificial intelligence met methods to improve healthcare. So uh, she will talk to us about uh, modeling this is transmissions in the presence of public health interventions during COVID-19. Thank you, Blanca. Thank you, Luis, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to be a bit of a shift from what we have been listening so far, uh, because um, we're going to be talking a bit about um, epidemiology and modeling. And in particular, one of the, of the key questions that epidemiologists and policymakers have been asking since the beginning of this pandemic revolves around what, what containment strategy should be adopted at different stages of the disease transmission, right? So that's kind of the, the question everybody wants to have answers, answers to. And so it turns out that this is an extremely difficult question to, to answer, at least with confidence, because it involves evidence and evidence relies on accurate and relevant data, and that means having good data, not only on disease transmission, like who is infectious for how long, how is the disease transmitted, how deadly is it, et cetera, but also on what is the effect of available interventions. So what happens if people wear masks in public places, how much does closing schools slow down transmission, and, and, and all that, right? So how to approach these questions and what data is needed to do so is what I will be discussing today. And I will do this with the help of Elliot Su, who is a PhD candidate working with me and whose PhD topic is precisely in the area of causal inference in health. So let me share my slides. Okay, let's talk a bit about modeling. All right, so mathematical and computational models of this is are used and have been used for hundreds of years now to generate knowledge about the processes of disease transmission and also to predict future counts. And these models can vary hugely with regards to the level of a complexity, but they are all based on the same principles. And these principles are that a susceptible individual or group of individuals becomes exposed to the disease, and then becomes infectious, and then after a while recovers and acquires immunity, or at least temporary immunity, or dies, right? And the transition between the infections and the spores is uh, controlled by what is called the incubation period, and this is a, 
a parameter that depends only on the infectiousness of the of the strain and uh, how the host is and is non modifiable via you know interventions external interventions then we have the transition between the infections and the recovery, which is controlled by the duration of the infection and is modifiable with pharmaceutical interventions. And for example, we know that when President Trump got um, a, a, a exposed and developed COVID-19, he was treated with a cocktail of drugs and some of which were antivirals and uh, antibodies that were uh, designed to um, uh, shorten the duration of the infection. Now, the, 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 the transition between infections and death, the fatality rate is also a, 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 um, a parameter that can be modified with medical treatment. So therefore, it depends not only on the strain of the virus and the host, but also on the state of the healthcare system. And we saw at the beginning of the pandemic how um, a lack of access to mechanical ventilators and ICU beds were responsible for a significant number of potentially preventable deaths. But perhaps the most, in, uh, I, will, and I just got I had this slightest uh, view of the fatality rates in Latin America as, um, you know, based on confirmed cases, of course, um, which could be imperfect. Uh, this, as you can see, an average of 3% uh, fatalities per case with some countries doing considerably worse than others. The worst here is Mexico that has a 10% case fatality rate. And then you have countries with a smaller number of counts um, like Ecuador and Bolivia, which still has also quite high uh, uh, number of deaths per case. But the key epidemi epidemiological parameter that I wanted to talk about uh, a bit more today is um, um, is this one is the transmission rate, right? The transmission rate is that the, the is what regulates uh, how many people, susceptible people become infectious, right? And it is also the hardest to estimate because it depends not only on the effectivity of the strain and, and uh, but also on behavioral patterns, contact patterns and the built environment, right? And it's of course different from, from every country and from every region. And uh, very often this uh, transmission rate is estimated in relation to what is called the effective reproduction number, which is a key epidemi epidemiological measure and is defined as the expected number of secondary infections resulting from an infectious individual at a given point in time, right? So all you, I'm sure we all agree that uh, ideally if you could, if policymakers could choose uh, a, a model uh, to, you know, to inform their policies, they would like to have something that tells them uh, what is the effect of these uh, different um, measures like using masks, washing your hands, keeping social distancing or, or, or isolation in this effective reproduction number over time. And what you want to see obviously is uh, these measures, you want to choose the measures that keep these numbers, um, this reproductive reproduction number hopefully consistently below one or the lowest you can without affecting, really affecting the economy. But what we have seen in terms of uh, previous work uh, at the beginning, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, what we saw is models like this one that I'm showing here, which uh, is uh, perhaps one of the most cited at the beginning of the outbreak by the Imperial College London, where they simulated a series of potential interventions like case isolation, voluntary quarantine, or whatever, social distancing, etc. So they came up with these possible scenarios and then they assume certain behaviors and contact patterns within these scenarios, then they code these patterns in their models and then they come up with a, a number of uh, you know, deaths and cases depending on each scenario. And this particular model was shown to the British government in mid-March and, and was one of the reasons why there was a change in policy, in policy because uh, the model indicated the, an unacceptable number of deaths if no action was taken. Uh, and this was initially implemented for the UK and the, and the US. But it's important to understand that this traditional approach to epidemic modeling is, is, is fine when we need to provide some ballpark numbers at the beginning of an outbreak, but it's not evidence-based approach. 
It's not an evidence of this approach because to start with, there is no way to determine the accuracy of the model forecasts, seeing the simulated interventions are hypothetical. So the model, on these models is not just this one in particular, of all other models, you know, of this type that are happening at the beginning when there's no real, no data. And they don't, do not adapt to new information, such as the evolution of the outbreak. They don't adapt to implementation of control interventions. And so in summary, they are not data-driven models. And one, one interesting thing that I have observed, and I'm sure you all have observed as well during this COVID-19 pandemic is because it's been such a huge event and it's been so many scientists around the world and engineers uh, sort of providing ways to having access to public data. And there's been a lot of uh, people involved in modeling for this COVID-19 that have never been traditional epidemiologists, but a lot of people from computer science and other fields. This has seen a huge, I think, uh, evolution and innovation in the traditional way that we used to see this, um, this task. And uh, we participated by looking at um, a model in which we uh, want to estimate the daily effective reproduction number over 101 countries and we want to do that because we want to use it as an early uh, early um, if, if, um, information of the effect of interventions as they happen and also to provide a better uh, forecast uh, but and, and Elliot is going to be talking a bit about the results on this model. But I just wanted to mention that uh, in order to run this type of uh, algorithms, we of course need, need data, and we need good quality data. And if see if I can one second, if I can reshare. Sorry, I'm just going to share my screen again. But this time I'm going to share. Uh, just bear with me. Just when I said this, uh, let's see if I can. Uh, yeah. Just wanted to share this uh, website. So you, everybody, of course, is familiar with some of these websites. This is the our world in data, where you can see uh, counts by country, and you can see a, you know test and uh, fatality rates etc the test is quite interesting because um, as you, as you know it's been mentioned before without the proper testing there is no knowledge of cases there is then uh, with specification of mortality rates and there is very little that one can do in terms of policy making if you don't understand what you know what we are dealing with and uh, as you can see, even here in this website is mentioning, it's showing the positive um, rate of test as a metric that is a good metric for uh, knowing how countries are testing. And it mentions even here how some countries like Australia, South Korea and Uruguay have a positive rate that is small, which is a good thing, while other countries such as uh, Mexico and Bolivia are uh, describes as bad examples of testing. Uh, I was reading the other day an article in the BMJ about Uruguay and their success with uh, COVID-19 and they mentioned that um, the fact that they uh, developed also their own, uh, started um, manufacturing their own uh, PCR test kit was important in their fight with COVID and in their success. And you can see here, like if you play this you can, uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of data in Latin America, so there's a lot of missing data compared to other countries. But you can see Uruguay clearly uh, being uh, among the countries, at least for which the ones for which this has data, um, among the countries with the smallest share of uh, positive testing, which is quite interesting. Uh, what else? Then we are using this other data set that has been mentioned before, and this is the one we use in our study from Job Hopkins, probably very similar. And then in terms of policy trackers, this is a very nice website as well that has uh, summarizes different, uh, it's a collection of different uh, uh, interventions by governments uh, across, again, across countries. So we, for example, use uh, uh, information on non-pharmaceutical interventions but there's also information on 
uh, macroeconomic and financial policy, tax policy, etc. So if we look at the one we're interested in for our study, we did use this one, the one from Oxford. And uh, is tracking um, in, uh, interventions in a quantitative way. And it divides the intervention if you look at the latest, uh, you have the latest uh, uh, Latin American um, um, and Caribbean um, um, in, in data. Um, they, they, they divide their interventions into, uh, I think it's nine types, including school closing, workplace closing, cancer, public health events, etc. Um, of course, it's important to understand that the quality of this data, as is again, as we mentioned before, is not 100% there because one thing is that the country, uh, you know, um, advertises a particular measure, and another different thing is how it is really implemented. And so, obviously, in different countries, implementation can look very different. And that information is not currently quantitative cap captured quantitatively in this data. So that's something that we are missing. And with this, I think I'm going to let uh, uh, Elliot um, continue showing some results from this, from our study. Let me see. I'll just stop sharing. Thank you, Bianca. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay, uh, so we started from our model and estimated the daily reproduction number for all the countries all over the world. So in this um, GIF picture, we just do animation for Latin American countries in particular. And we can see the most peak of the daily reproduction number happens in the early pandemic, which is around the March. And then it generally um, cools down um, as we're approaching the late, I uh, think August to, to uh, November, so to today. So we can see the uh, reproduction number of most Latin American countries are below one at the current stage. Yeah, like these black maps indicates most reproduction are below one. Um, we choose a few countries as an example today to see how the impact of the social distancing and other public health uh, measures are affecting the uh, transmission rate and how transmission rate, the daily reproduction number can be an early indicator of the future um, cases. Uh, so in this first figure here, we illustrate the um, estimated daily reproduction number in Brazil since uh, their first case in March until uh, 25th uh, or 28th of October. Um, the red lines here are the social, in, uh, um, social distancing measures that we captured using the Oxford Public Health um, Tracker. Uh, and we can see after the introduction of the social distancing measures in the late March, the daily reproduction number uh, suddenly decreases. While we cannot see any obvious trend in the new daily cases. But um, as we go um, after the, uh, into the April, we can see the daily reproduction number um, kind of um, goes down and keeps around the one. And we can see these social distancing measures had an impact on continuing the transmission of the disease. But um, this effect is not reflected in the reported cases until um, say around the July of 2020. Um, then we can see the early containment of the um, daily transmission has an impact on the um, daily new cases. But since there is no um, any other um, social distancing measures was introduced um, since um, March, we can see the daily cases and the, the daily reproduction number again starts to increase from the August 2020. 
which we can see there is a um, daily reproduction number above one and an increase of the daily new cases uh, since uh, August. And this trend was continued to increase um, until recently. So we, um, we can predict the future cases using the daily reproduction number at the current stage. Uh, which was uh, presented in this third figure. Uh, so we uh, matched the predicted number using a constant reproduction number and uh, uh, predicted the new daily cases using the stochastic model. And we can see uh, at the current estimation, uh, the new number of cases um, in Brazil will have a uh, relative stable increasing, but not dramatically increasing, um, which is generally co uh, in cons uh, con consistent with the uh, reported uh, number of incidents. As in contrast with, uh, we select another country, Colombia, uh, where less uh, social distancing measures was introduced at the start of the pandemic. Uh, so we can see in Colombia, the daily reproduction number was increased dramatically um, recently. And we assume that uh, this increase in the daily reproduction number is because of there is no early intervention or enough early intervention um, was in place. Um, and because of the, um, there's not enough um, social distancing measures in place and um, the daily reproduction number was keeping um, fluctuating and above one. And this is a reason for uh, why they have uh, a rapid increase in new daily cases uh, recently. And we can also see in the last figure that the um, predicted uh, daily cases is also um, expect to have um, a high increase um, leading to the end of the October. Um, as another case that we found is in the Germany. So there's two peaks um, for most European countries. First peak was happened in March and April and another peak was happened recently, the second wave. Um, and we can see like for co uh, countries like Germany, um, they introduced uh, the social distancing measures um, kind of um, between the peak of the pandemic or, the, um, or a bit later than the, uh, um, than the peak of the RT. So like in the first figure, we can see um, they introduced, they closed their borders um, kind of after the peak of the um, RT. And then after introducing of all the as, uh, social distancing measures, the RT also decreased sharply. And then the new daily cases um, followed by the decline in the daily reproduction number also has a declining. There's a lag about one month. So the first uh, wave was um, cooled down by this social distancing measure quite effectively. However, there's also like in Brazil, there's no other um, social distancing measures introduced uh, um, after the first peak. That's why um, the daily production number starts to increase um, above one again. So once it's above one, um, we are expecting the daily new cases to increase again, which we observed recently. There's a, a quite significant uh, outbreak recently. And also in the last figure, we can see the prediction also matches the uh, recent reported incidence trend. Um, so this is the findings, the major findings we have for this study. Um, and I'm hand over to Blanca for the conclusion. Yes, um, just that um, uh, you can find us um, at the Center for Big Data Research and Health in Join SW. Uh, we have a preprint of our paper, uh, which is being was submitted a few months ago already to Nature Scientific Reports, and we planning to have a live website where people can access the estimations of daily reproduction numbers 
uh, in real time. And you know, that's it. Questions are welcome. And thank you for the opportunity to talk in this webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Blanca and Elliot. I strongly recommend you to go through uh, the paper they have submitted to, to Nature. It's a fantastic paper and provides a very good um, idea how we should blend uh, big data analysis together with health policy um, in, uh, in this international comparison. So thank you very much for your presentation. We are really over time, but um, uh, I would like to say uh, two things. One is that the first, the aim of this first webinar was to show and visualize the level of cooperation between uh, Australian researchers and, and Latin American researchers on understanding better the situation in Latin America. Uh, the next webinars will, we have invited key leaders in public health, uh, um, policy um, and um, and COVID uh, in um, in uh, the several Latin American countries. Uh, thank you, uh, Francesco, Elio, Ana Rita, and Blanca for your contribution. I I'm sorry, but we have to leave the Q and A here. Uh, we have another question by Pedro Ernesto Azofeifa, but we will move it to the mental health um, panel. And I will invite uh, Noel uh, to close this first webinar on, on Latin American COVID. Thanks very much, uh, Luis, and thanks to all of the participants. It's been a tremendous uh, first start in the series of uh, five webinars on the impact of, of COVID on health and health, health policy. Uh, let me just close then by um, reminding you that on the Friday the 13th, an auspicious day, the second webinar will be held, that is Australian time, nine o'clock in the morning on Friday the 13th, that is to say Thursday evening in, uh, in Latin America. So we look forward to seeing you all uh, uh, tuning in to that uh, session. It'll be looking in particular at uh, the case studies of three countries in South America, Brazil, Chile and Uruguay, with a quite a variation in approaches. So that should be tremendously interesting to, to, to compare approaches and learn lessons from what's been done. Uh, I'd also like to, um, if I could, acknowledge the um, assistance of some other participants, the Australian Academy of Science, for example, uh, the Australian Studies Centre in Montevideo. It's been great to have uh, support from institutions like this as well. And finally, uh, Thanks again to uh, my fellow panelists, to Luis, Francesco, Anarita, Blanca, and Elliot. Uh, and thanks in particular to Marisa Linkson, who has handled so capably the logistics of uh, today's session. So uh, until then, until next week, that is Friday the 13th, uh, or Thursday evening the 12th in Latin America, uh, stay safe. Cuídense mucho and uh, hasta la próxima. Thank you very much.